Um, first off, good morning, all. Uh, thank you for attending our next uh, Eastern Region Science Training webinar this morning. Um, as a heads up, before we get started, uh, just as a notice, this webinar is being recorded. So any questions or comments, please throw them in the chat or feel free to raise your hand as well throughout the course of the presentation and we can address them in due time. So this morning, uh, the topic is JPS data applications. What can it do for you? To introduce the speaker this morning, we have Jarrell Torres from CIRA, the Cooperative Institute for Research in the Atmosphere, which is co-located with Colorado State University. Jarrell's role involves being a liaison between the National Weather Service user community and the research community focusing on JPSS products, applications, satellite training development for users, and the collection of user feedback. He got his master's degree in atmospheric and environmental science from the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology in 2015, and his bachelor's degree in atmospheric science from the University of Louisiana at Monroe in 2011. Jarrell, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Glad to have you. Looking forward to a great conversation. And the floor is yours. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you, Jordan. And I appreciate the invites. And uh, so uh, we'll get started here. So quickly, I just want to highlight um, just the what I'll be talking about today, some of the things that we'll focus on uh, in regards to JPSS. So we're going to have a quick overview of what JPSS is. We're going to highlight a variety of applications from JPSS. We're also going to show how users can uh, utilize not only the geo data sets, so GO 16, 18, um, and then also the polar orbiting data sets together um, for the operational mission and how users can become more comfortable utilizing both data sets. And then also, uh, very importantly, I can, I'll show how users can access the data in AWIPS and also online. And then also I will highlight the satellite training materials and or resources that are available for our users. And of course, at the end, um, I will request, request user feedback on the data sets and uh, I look forward to the Q&A. So a quick overview of JPSS. What is it? It is the Joint Polar Satellite System. It helps improve weather forecasting via simulation of observations into NWP models, helps provide a global coverage over the oceans and data sparse regions, um, and also provides observational value in complement to the geostationary satellites. Now, currently, uh, the JPSS constellation consists of five satellites, and two are currently in orbit per producing data and imagery for our users, and that is the SUMI National Polo Orbiting Partnership, or SMPP satellites, and then the JPSS-1, or what is known as the NOAA-20 satellite. And what we look forward to is the launch of JPSS-2, or which will be known as NOAA-21, once it reaches orbit, that will provide even more data uh, for our users. Now, we look forward to that launch within the next day or two. It's tentatively scheduled to launch uh, tomorrow morning uh, from Vandenberg Space Force Base out there in California. And then, and then in addition to those three satellites, we also look forward to uh, JPSS-3 and JPSS-4 within the next decade. Now, these satellites exhibit analogous instrumentation on board, and we're talking about uh, three of the five instruments in particular. We're talking about the visible infrared, uh, visible imaging infrared radiometer suite, or VIRS, uh, instruments, and then your ATMS and your CRIS instruments. Now, with the JPSS data sets, how can it be applicable for you, and when can you expect the data? Two, there's two concepts that um, that can be associated with uh, with expecting the data here. Uh, unlike the geostationary data sets, uh, we got to focus on the temporal resolution. First of all, with the polar orbiting data sets, um, they're not as timely as goes. So you're going to be getting uh, swats from the polar orbiters uh, at least two times a day per polar orbiting satellite. So you'll get at least two from SMPP and then at least two from NOAA 20. And then during the daytime, when to expect the data um, from east to west, it'll be between 16 to 22 Z. And if we're talking about specifically eastern region, you'll most likely be getting the data, I would say, between 16 to 18 Z. 
and the eastern half of Conus. And then, of course, during the nighttime, uh, ac across the lower 48, you'll be expecting the swaths between 6 to 12 Z. Um, so for eastern region, you'll most likely be getting the data between, I would say, 6 to 8 Z uh, time frame uh, every morning. And then, of course, uh, for Alaska users, um, we're, they, they receive more frequent overpasses over the northern high latitudes. Now, remember with SMPP and NOAA 20, their orbital, orbital swaths are separated by about 50 minutes or so. Now, another key aspect in regards to when to be expecting the data is the concept of data latency, or essentially the time difference between the satellite overpass to when that data set is viewable in your AWIP system or, or online. And if we're talking about just specifically AWIPS and getting any data sets via the satellite broadcast network, that latency is coarse. It'd be about an hour to hour and a half. However, if you have access to direct broadcast capabilities, it'll be approximately 30 minutes or so. Now we'll transition here to some of the uh, applications from JPSS. And uh, the first one here I just wanted to highlight is the nighttime visible imagery applications from the VIRS near constant contrast product, which is derived from the day night band um, at 0 0.7 micron, providing unique visible imagery at night. This data set is currently in your AWIP system and then also online. And with this data, it observes atmospheric features via reflected moonlight and senses emitted lights during the nighttime hours. And uh, what you can see in this particular animation here is over the north northern high plains, you could, you could observe the snow aerial extent or snow cover being observed by the nighttime visible imagery. The array of emitted lights, uh, which could be either towns or gas um, emitted lights from towns or cities, but then also gas flares in western North Dakota. As we know that in western North Dakota, it's um, quite known for its oil and gas industry out there. And of course, uh, you can see your reflected uh, moonlight off of uh, cloud cover as well. Some other applications from the nighttime visible imagery. If you look at, at the top left and top middle an animations, you'll see the applications of observing nighttime fire smoke during the nighttime, which is pretty key, especially from the satellite point of view. It is a little bit challenging to see uh, nighttime fire smoke um, in the infrared. So, but we, you can you le leverage this, these data sets to observe your nighttime fire smoke. Here's an example of a strong smoke, uh, strong smoke plume from the Dixie Fire out there in um, California. And then here's one uh, from the Black Fire in southern New Mexico. Uh, some other applications from the nighttime visible imagery. You can observe your auroras during the nighttime. You can observe emitted lights from uh, volcanic eruptions. Here's just uh, an anim animation between the NCC and then your, your GOES um, shortwave IR. You can also observe uh, low-level status and fog with your nighttime visible imagery. And then, of course, uh, tropical cyclones um, applications as well. And then I guess, and then here's a few more applications to note. Uh, you have lake ice monitoring. You can utilize um, this one's over Lake Erie. Uh, sea ice monitoring as well. Uh, nighttime convection, uh, tropical cyclones, as we mentioned before. And then importantly here in the bottom right, you can infer in a qualitative manner um, areas that may be experiencing power outages. And that is seen in the animation here of areas that are um, that you see the emitted city lights that are significantly reduced in certain areas. So in this example here, um, you have Hurricane Ida that passed through uh, the Gulf Coast. And then a day or two later, you can see the significant reduction of those emitted city lights. So you can Infer in a qualitative manner in southern Mississippi and southeastern Louisiana, some of the areas that are experiencing power outages. Now we'll transition to some um, other fire monitoring applications. Here's an example of some, some of your VIRS fire RGBs. They're a little bit similar to the GOES versions, except these are at higher spatial resolution. So this is just an animation over the course of a week or so. I believe this one's of the Dixie fire here, um, which shows your VIRS Dayland Cloud Fire RGB, which is sensitive to fire smoke and vegetation health. And you can see the, um, the application there observing that fire smoke, and then also being able to observe your burn scars as well, which then can be helpful for um, 
future hydrological applications and, and or flash flooding applications. And then also you have your Veer's fire temperature RGB here uh, that can be utilized uh, to infer your fire intensities, which, which the fire pixels go from red to orange to yellow to white pixels. Yellow and white pixels indicate the most intense portions of the fire here. So you can see in the northern and eastern portions of that fire, you can see where it is um, quite intense. Note that these particular RGBs are not yet available for um, in AWIPS for the lower 48. However, they are available online. And then here's just a more recent example of the uh, Calf Canyon Hermit's Peak fire out there in northern New Mexico over this past uh, summer. Also, we have our Veers Active Fire product. This one is in AWIPS and also online. You can detect active fires with this product during the day and or night. It has three main display outputs, fire location, fire radiative power, and then also fire confidence uh, in different confidence intervals, low, nominal, and high. It's at high spatial resolution at 375 meters uh, in AWIPS. And here's just an example of that Calf Canyon Hermit Peak fire here. And in the imagery, you're gonna be seeing an array of different colored pixels where pixels will go from yellows to oranges to reds to dark reds. The more red or dark red the pixel is, the more intense the fire is. And then here's just a more recent example of the moose fire out there in Idaho. And then also, um, we can also leverage our individual spectral channels. Here's just the 3.7 shortwave IR here, observing the fire hotspots seen by the warm brightness temperatures here. And this is you're kind of seeing the fire perimeter of the Boot Lake fire in Oregon. Um, I believe that was uh, summer of 2021. Also, what it has been a fan favorite over the last few years is the Hearst Smoke model. And uh, this has been seen, um, especially over the social media realms uh, from WFOs messaging the importances of the uh, human health impacts uh, in um, their respective CWAs and also um, the lower of uh, the lowered visibilities as well. And here's just an animation of the Hearst smoke models here of the near surface smoke and the vertically integrated smoke products um, that are available to users. Now these two particular products here are not only available online, but they are also available in AWIPS um, for you to utilize. Here's just some uh, additional characteristics about uh, the Hearst smoke model with uh, the three kilometer spatial resolution, providing hourly updates, simulating the fire smoke emissions, plume rise and smoke distribution. Now the fire points are initialized by the Veers and Modus FRP. And in addition, oh, here's just an uh, example of the near surface smoke model here, forecasting out four hours at this particular timestamp of the fires in New Mexico and what was actually seen um, at that particular timestamp. Uh, and you can see that nice curvy uh, smoke signature that's being produced. Also notes that there's also the uh, vertical cross sections that are available to users as well from the Hearst smoke model. Here's just an example from back in 2020 of the Cameron Peak wildfire and East Troublesome wildfires in North Central Colorado. You can see your smoke concentrations with height over complex terrain. Note the vertical cross sections are not yet available in AWIPS. However, they are available online for user consumption. Now we'll transition to some of the blended products. Uh, first one here is the Invected Layer Precipital Water product. Um, this one, there, there are tentative plans for this to become operational for users uh, sometime next year, 2023. Note it's at 16 kilometer um, uh, spatial resolution with hourly uh, data sets. Um, it has four atmospheric layers and it, it goes from surface to 850 which you see in the top left, 850 to 700, top right, 700 to 500, bottom left, 500 to 300, bottom right. And you're seeing Hurricane Ida making landfall and moving inland there. And then also with the ALPW, you can also observe like atmospheric rivers, for example. You can see the nice long atmospheric plumes, uh, moisture plumes that can be seen advecting into uh, uh, along the coast there. Now, you also have accessibility to global blended products. 
um, such as your blended TPW, which you see at the top, and then your percent of normal TPW data sets as well. These are currently available in your ALIP system uh, to utilize. And then there's also your rain rate products as well. And then here's just examples. Uh, I believe this was Hurricane, I think Larry, um, back last year. And then also you have accessibility to your satellite drive soundings. Specifically, we're talking about the NUCAPS data sets, or the NOAA Unique Combined Atmospheric Processing System. They're essentially temperature and moisture retrievals derived from CRIS and ATMS instruments. When you see a swath uh, that comes into uh, your AOP system over the lower 48, you'll see an array of green, yellow, and red data quality soundings. Green meaning good quality data soundings. Yellow meaning OK. And then red uh, are bad data quality soundings. And here's just an example of being able to observe um, a new caps um, sounding near or around a fire. And uh, if you click on that sounding, this is what you'll see in your AWIP system. And you can see near this particular fire in South Texas, you can see um, how dry it is um, within the boundary layer there. Now note, with new caps, you not only have access to your individual uh, SKU-T profiles, but you also have access to your plan view and cross-section displays. Here's just an example of a plan view from your grid new caps data sets, observing um, your, your total precipital water values in two dimensions here. And you're just seeing the uh, lower precipital water values uh, near or around this fire being observed. The star just indicates where the fire uh, was located. Now, what we also have is what we call the snowfall rate or the SFR and the merged snowfall rate product or the MSFR data sets. These particular data sets uh, are not widely available in AWIPS for users, although there are select WFOs that have access to this. Now, if you have interest in accessing this product and if you don't have it, I can connect you with the, excuse me, um, I can connect you with the appropriate personnel to get you those data sets. So on the left here, what you're seeing is the snowfall rate product over um, over the state of Colorado and the Central Rockies. And it's essentially, it's a liquid equivalent snow freight, snowfall rate product that is derived from multiple um, microwave instruments uh, that are associated with nine satellites. They essentially ident identify extent and the intensity of snow. Of course, this is valuable in data sparse regions and where radar is poor or limited. And um, essentially, you're getting about 18 overpasses per day over the mid-latitudes. And, uh, uh, and of course, more over Alaska. And note, with their overpasses, um, they're not evenly distributed. So you're not going to be getting data like every hour, but it'll be interspersed uh, throughout the day. And uh, the latency there, the data latency is approximately 30 to 50 minutes, uh, with the exception of some of the DMSP um, satellite data, which is up to about two hours. Um, so that's the snowfall rate product. Now, they also have what is called the merge snowfall rate product, which is on the right, which integrates both the SFR, but then also the NSSL MRMS instantaneous precipitation rate data here. So you can see that um, over uh, the central Rockies there. Uh, and this combines the broader spatial coverage from SFR, but then also the high temporal resolution of the radar data. And that's available every 10 minutes. But as I noted, if you have interest in this data set, uh, please let me know. And if you don't have access, we can get you that access. And here's just uh, an example. If you're able to access it in AWIPS, these are the particular data sets um, available or that are associated with these products that you can have access to. Not only the liquid equivalent snowfall rates, but then also the 10 to 1, 18 to 1, 35 to 1 uh, ratios as well. Uh, just some additional data sets uh, to think about and consider. Uh, we also have uh, some of these RGBs. You have the Veer Snowmelt RGB here in the top left um, that can help users in a qualitative manner infer areas of dry snow compared to wet snow, which can be helpful for snowmelt ap applications. Uh, you can also utilize the data for um, sea, um, lake ice monitoring. Here's just an example of a ship breaking through the lake ice over Lake Erie. And then also dust, uh, 
which um, you can also be able to observe with the viewers data sets and of course the sea ice monitoring as well um, and then uh, here's just some more data sets but I want to uh, focus primarily on the 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 imagery in the top middle and also the top right here the top middle and top right are associated with the Veers flood product. Now this one, in the near future, uh, I would assume after the holidays into next year sometime, um, this Veers flood product uh, will, be, will eventually become available for users uh, to be able to access. It's at 375 meter spatial resolution and can uh, differentiate between different scene types such as land and brown, clouds and gray, open water, and blue, but most importantly, you'll observe the inundation in an area, any type of flooding that's occurring, and that's in uh, from yellows to oranges and reds, and you can see some of the inundations over uh, the state of Louisiana there. And then you could also see the snow cover uh, and ice cover you can observe with that data as well. Now, I'll quickly highlight I'll quickly highlight how we can utilize the JPSS data sets with your geostationary data sets. Just because we want users to be able to utilize them together for the operational mission, but then also utilize it comfortably as well. So here's just an example from the fire monitoring point of view. So you have this fire out there in New Mexico, it's Cook's Peak fire. And you have your, if you look at the animation to the right, or the, the most, uh, the uh, furthest right, and you'll see your GOES fire temperature RGB there. And you're seeing um, the high temporal refresh rates, being able to observe the evolution of the fire there. Um, every, uh, in this particular case, every five minutes using the Kona sector. But note that during this particular time frame, you are getting data from your polar orbiters. So if you look on the, 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 the left side, you'll see uh, at 1916Z and then 2009Z, uh, the two overpasses that over, that come um, and are displayed, and you can see a little bit finer details of the fire perimeter um, and also the, the fire intensity uh, and where that is on the northern periphery of that fire, and um, and so you can see that higher spatial resolution, although the VIRS datasets are not as timely. And then in the middle, you'll see that just the the comparison at one particular timestamp at 2010Z, just showing the differences in that spatial resolution. And with the VIRS data sets, it's my understanding that it is parallax uh, corrected as well, and, ter and terrain corrected as well. Um, and I believe for GOES, I think they're working on that um, at the moment. But uh, just know, um, but in the end, uh, I just want you guys to know that this is, what you, this is one way of how you can integrate both data sets uh, for the operational mission here. Now, how can you access the data? Um, so in AWIPS, all you have to do is go to your satellite tab, scroll down to SMPP and NOAA 20, then you'll be able to access your VIRS data sets, you'll be able to access your soundings, new caps, and also your, your gridded new caps, and then your derived products, uh, such as your VIRS active fire. Um, now, the global blended products, as I mentioned earlier, it's just a little bit different. It's just going back to your satellite tab, scrolling down the polar derived products imagery, then going to your, your whoop, sorry about that. You go down to your polar derived products imagery, go to your global blended hydro products, and then your blended TPW, percent of normal, and your blended rain rates are available there. And then here's just an example of the snowfall rate if you were able to access it in your AWIP system. And it's going down to the local menu items. Go to NASA Sport, Polar Imager, and then you should have your array of data sets there. So that's how you can access the data in your AWIP system. What about online? And I know at the onset of the pandemic, there were a lot of NWS users that were not only working in the office, but were transitioning and working at home. And uh, that may still exist today. Um, and it's one of those where we want users to be able to access the data no matter where they're at, um, if it's in AWIPS or if it's online. So here's just an example of uh, an array of different links that users can go access near real-time imagery. And um, 
and yes, I can uh, drop some of the links into the chat as well here. Uh, but here's just a few of the links um, where you can access near real time imagery here. And what I'll have here is a quick demo uh, to access two particular links the JPSS imagery for users web page. As I mentioned, with this particular web page, we developed it at the onset of the pandemic to help our users to be, be able to access near real time imagery data sets. Um, and I'll show that to you here in a second. And then the second one will be the Sierra Polar Slider web, uh, web page, where you can access the near real time JPSS data. So I'll quickly exit out of my PowerPoint here. And I have it already uploaded. So hopefully that is viewable on your uh, system here. So this is what it looks like. And I'll actually quickly, hold on one second. Oh, I, I see Jordan has put that into the chat. So thank you, Jordan. Um, so here's just an example of the JPSS imagery for users web page. So I, I personally maintain this web page and I will in in future months, I plan to update it as well, especially with the J2 data sets that will be flowing as well. But essentially we have this uh, table here that can be filtered um, and you can type in say, polar slider, for example, and it'll populate there. You can let's go back here. If you just type in veers, um, it should be able to move there. Or if I type in like new caps, it'll highlight certain, certain ones. Uh, but you have a nice little uh, filter table there. But point being, you can access near real time veers imagery, satellite derived soundings from like say new caps, your fire applications, hydro applications, some of the hydro applications consist of like the ALPW, not only over CONUS, but if you had interest in looking at other sectors, um, your SFR and MSFR data sets. Now with SFR, um, they're developing, the product developers are developing a new web page for that to access online. So once I get that, I'll update it accordingly. Uh, also there's flood products uh, available, uh, your global blended products, Mimic, Seamorph, um, your RGB data sets, and then also your direct broadcast or DB um, accesses as well. And then there's also additional, um, here at the bottom, here's some uh, sea surface temperature imagery that can be accessible to you as well, whether it be from the polar orbiting data sets or from the geo. So you can check that out. And that also, I believe it covers the Great Lakes as well. So you can definitely check that out. And then of course, um, with every satellite and with our field in general, there's always a, an assortment of acronyms, but in regards to polar orbiting data sets, here's just a nice list of acronyms and links you can get access to. And then also if you had questions of like, of when to expect the data, in addition to what I've provided already, um, there's a few links here from SMPP and NOAA 20, where like say today you can figure out, just by clicking on those links, when that overpass will be coming over your respective areas. So just be aware of this. Um, so that's available there. And then also, um, as I switch my tabs here, we are. this is the uh, Sierra slider interface. So you may be familiar with it uh, from the ghost point of view. As I'm showing here, you have access to ghost 16, 17, and 18. You also have access to Hemawari and Medioset as well. But importantly, going from the JPSS point of view, all you have to do is click on JPSS. What I'll quickly do here before I keep going. I'll uh, share this link into the chat here, just a quick hyperlink. And that should be shared there for you uh, to, so you can observe what I'm seeing here. And um, you can zoom in, you can right click, zoom in, go to like 1.5 kilometers, for example. Of course, this is over like Alaska, just because they get um, a higher temporal uh, refresh rate from your viewers data sets in the northern high latitudes. But I will zoom out real quick. Let's go to six kilometers here. And then we have this rotate function where we can go over the lower 48 and pan over. And I'll just go to, I know what is of interest uh, to most MET folks at the moment, I guess it depends on your CWA, but um, is uh, Tropical Storm Nicole here out there in the southeast. And if you zoom down, you can see some of the swaths from the polar orbiters. I know it's at a different like projection at the moment, but 
Um, so here's just an example of Tropical Storm Nicole here. But um, in the incoming months here at CIRA, we are working on um, providing a CONUS view that will be able to overlap not only your geo data from GOES, but then also your VIRS data sets. So once that becomes available, then I'll be able to distribute that information to users. And then you'll be able to have an interface similar to like this, um, but over the lower 48. Um, so uh, look forward to that. So now I'll transition back to my PowerPoint. And I'm almost done here. I think I just have two more slides, and then we can get to Q&A here. So, um, so with all your data sets that are available to you, just know that we also have developed um, a lot of satellite training materials for users. Now, I'm a part of a, um, I'm a part of several cooperative institutes, and uh, NOAA Oaklo and and Comet in Boulder, and a few other entities that help develop satellite training materials, whether it be from the GOES or from the JPSS point of view, and develop these training materials to help our users understand the products, excuse me, and also understand the utility of the products and how you can utilize them in operations and utilize them comfort comfortably. And uh, from my perspective, I developed the, I helped develop the Polo orbiting ones. So here's a few links on some of those training resources, uh, whether they be individual spectral channels, products, or RGBs. We have what we call quick guides, or one to two page product reference materials for our users that you can access um, these uh, particular data sets. And then these quick guides essentially highlight several important factors. Why is this product important? The algorithm makeup, um, spatial, temporal resolutions, data latency, primary applications, limitations, and also uh, imagery interpretation. Uh, when you see uh, the imagery come in, what are you seeing and how can you interpret it? So these are pretty, uh, these are quite useful and can be helpful for you. And we have these quick guides, but then we also have these product application videos and quick briefs as well. Now, if you want to know more about just JPSS in general, uh, there's that satellite foundational course we developed back in, I believe, 2018 that you can go check out, register for, and um, take the training on that. And then what we also have is the Visit Tel Training Calendar 2. This one, not only myself, but a few folks here at CIRA and then also at SIMS uh, lead, lead and provide tele-training to users uh, weekly, uh, w whether it be from the GOES data sets or, or the Polar. And we offer it weekly, and uh, in, uh, WFOs can sign up uh, whenever uh, uh, whenever they have time, and they can take some uh, training on on whatever we're offering if they have interest. And then, lastly, as I come to a close, I just also want to highlight here in the top left. Um, so here at CIRA, they're working on some experimental products uh, specifically for aviation users not only over Alaska with the VIRS data sets, but also over CONUS with the ABI GOES data sets. And this could be helpful for, um, say, pilots or aviation users. And, per and, and it, it pretty much encapsulates users being able to customize particular flight routes and be able, being able to observe their vertical cloud or your cloud vertical cross sections with heights and being able to identify areas of uh, liquid water clouds, super cool clouds, ice clouds, uh, mixed phase, and then also integrating some of the PIREPS data or air reps data, um, indicating areas of turbulence or icing. Point being, uh, if you have interest in checking out some of that experimental data, you can go click on that link or check out that link there. And um, you can also provide us feedback. There's a feedback form you can go check out. And that'll be helpful for our product developers here at CIRA and how we can help them improve uh, upon that product. And then, uh, but with that, I appreciate your time. Uh, there's my contact information there, my emails, um, Twitter handle there. Uh, we look forward to the launch of JPSS2, which is supposed to be uh, slated for tomorrow morning. And uh, hopefully it launches tomorrow morning. And then um, with that, I thank you for your time. And uh, there's just a few questions there. I have for you guys if you um, have interest in answering those, whether it be from 
Um, like, are you familiar with any of these data sets? Uh, if so, what do you what do you utilize in operations? Um, also, how do you access the data is very important to me as well. But with that, I thank you for your time. And are there any questions? Darrell, um, so first off, thank you so much for this excellent presentation. I see Jeff has a question. Beat me to it. Go ahead. Hey, Darrell, thank you for the presentation. Um, uh, kind of a quick question um, regarding um, uh, JPS has to NOAA 21. Yes. Uh, assuming successful launch tomorrow and all goes well, uh, when do you expect data to become available? And then maybe more importantly, is um, viewing an AWIPS tied to a certain uh, AWIPS build being delivered? So I think more details will come on the particular build. Um, I. It's one of those where if it launches tomorrow, um, I believe it's supposed to become operational like after six months. So we're probably talking about next next spring or summertime. Uh, but then I know there's of course um, OT and E, you know, uh, just testing and evaluation, and then we'll get the appropriate RPM package from Tower S, and they'll update you guys with that with. Um, the accessibility to data sets. And then um, what was, uh, uh, could you remind me of your first question? Yeah, well, yeah, the, the first question was, yeah, so when, you know, essentially when data would start to flow. So you kind of answered that. Okay. And, 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 and I guess you kind of answered the second that it's really going to be, um, you know, in terms of AWIPS access, that'll be handled through an RPM rather than, um, well, I assume it'll eventually be, you know, be, be baselined, but, um, but the main delivery will be via an RPM, so it's not necessarily tied to a to a build. Yeah, I would, I would definitely say at least um, six to nine months or so. Uh, it will just depend on the overall testing and evaluation, make sure all the data is flowing correctly, you know, the quality flags, all that kind of stuff. Um, so we're probably probably looking at next summer slash fall, I would say. Um, but if anything comes sooner, I'll, I'll let you know. Uh, and then also in AWIPS, um, and it's my understanding that if we're getting any data via the SBN. Uh, once the NOAA 21 data becomes operational, and what I mean by that is in your AWIP system, it is my understanding that the NOAA 21 data sets will replace your SMPP data sets. I know there. I know with the SBN, uh, they ha they have issues with um, uh, what is it called bandwidth, yeah, uh, sure. and and uh, but. Um, if that is indeed the case with the SBN, just note that getting data online is my understanding that most likely, um, such as like Polar Slider and a few other websites as well, you'll be able to get all three SWADs. So you'll be getting data from SMPP, NOAA 20, and NOAA 21. So, uh, but uh, in addition to the SBN in AWIPS, of course, you have um, data sets you can access via LDM. Which then could potentially access data from all three, you know, like uh, maybe potentially say like maybe L ALPW for example, which has a, a corporate uh, which incorporates a lot of the polar orbiting data sets, not only from NOAA 20 SMPP, uh, but then other polar orbiters as well. So um, there could be data flowing that way through blended products as well. So, but we'll get a better idea once uh, next spring and summer come along of uh, how everything's going to shake out. Does that help? Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Perfect. That was going to be one of my questions. So you got it before I did. Yeah. Uh, Jack, you have the next hand. Feel free, please. Yeah, I'll just put a link in there because I know from my involvement with the Nod folks that they're working on getting JPSS data out on at least AWS, if not the other cloud platforms that Nod works with, Google and Microsoft. But um, oh, So that's yeah. out there. And I know that they sometimes put maybe some of the experimental i guess or provisional data in buckets out there as that happens but i know that's sort of a you know and there's this call whether or not that flows that way oh that's, oh go ahead sorry yeah. and so cause, cause it came up with uh i think himawari data is out there on one of the cloud stores and they're going to himawari nine and so 
one's going to replace the other sort of directly. You know, so that sounded a little bit like your mention of SNPP would get replaced by NOAA 21, if I heard that right. Yeah, that was that's only uh, that's my understanding, and that's only for the SBN. Okay. Um, so if it's LDM or getting your data through other avenues, uh, there could be potential for getting all three. Yeah, so, I guess my other comment with the, with all the data flows and everything, the the AWIPS in the cloud discussions, I think, as, as you all know, you know that that's sort of a potential way to um, move data to be viewed. Mm -hmm. So, but I mean, that's obviously wrapped up in a lot of details that I'm not privy to, but I know some of those discussions are talking about tapping into remote stores that are not necessarily SBN or LDM, at least for non-operational purposes. So mm -hmm. there's all that as well. The, the, the data is everywhere. Yeah, it is. It is. And that's a good point. I appreciate the link there because uh, I'll look forward to that and um, I'll take a look at that too and see what they currently have. Because um, I guess it depends on the, the cloud interface, whether it be AWS or other avenues. But it's my understanding within the next year or two, there'll be more pull over in data sets available, whether it be AWS yeah. or the others. Um, when it, hopefully, you'll incorporate all like the individual spectral channels and the products. Uh, um, RGBs, I'm unsure because that's more experimental. Um, so, But we'll, we'll see what happens there. But uh, more importantly, though, you were mentioning the AWIPS in the cloud, and I know that's becoming more um, popular, especially for deployed meteorologists or IMETs um, as well. And what we're trying to work on ways of trying to get our, at least make available our data sets from the polar orbiting point of view into those AWIPS in the cloud, whether it's become, coming from, like, say, OPG or the Operational Proving Ground. Um, I know they have one in Boulder at the uh, the NOAA Oklo FTDT um, um, entity out there uh, where data sets will be flowing over there, but be more for like uh, satellite training purposes, for example, and or user consumption that way. I know Tower S has their own AWIPS in the cloud that some of you may be familiar with. So uh, as you were saying, there's a lot of ways to access it, but it's just trying to make sure who has access to what. <laughs> and then and then I can relay that information to you guys of, oh, you can access this cloud over here, and this has X, Y, and Z product and or data set, and so on and so forth. So, But uh, we, we live in exciting times, and technology has advanced incredibly, and uh, hopefully get the data into our users' hands. Uh, um, Jack, I'll just also add to that, um, based on some of the initial plans, there could be a phase out of some of this data or all three data sets like Jarrell mentioned, but I think some of these conversations are still in flux. So I think some of this is still a TBD, but um, as soon as that information is decided upon, when it's decided upon, which I think also play is in part connected to the checkout phase and how that goes as well for JPSS2, then more information will be able to come out on all that. Um, regarding data availability and where where and when and for how long and so on and so forth. Yeah, what's, um, all, what's also the, I just want to quickly add, so um, so we'll have NOAA 20, NOAA 21 here, and the, the interesting thing will be SMPP. Why do I say that? Because it's been, it's been up there for over 10 years. And usually the lifespan of satellites are just a general estimate, usually like five to eight years or so. So it's it's been doing gr well and hopefully it keeps producing data so um, if it can still produce data uh, we look forward to having all three producing data sets at least for the next year or two so but it'll be interesting how my point overall point is it'll be interesting how long SNPP will be up there until it gets eventually decommissioned um, just because of the end of its lifespan so so all right, question, uh, question asked and answered for now. Uh, Ryan, you've been patient. Sorry. You're no, it's just... okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Cool. Uh, Yorl, thanks for a great presentation. I learned a lot. Um, I gave a satellite book club talk a couple of months ago on mesoanalysis, use of satellite data. I was asked the question, did I use JPSS sounding data during the mesoanalysis process. 
Mm -hmm. Of course, I, I had to say no. I apologize. Uh, do you all have an archive present of JPSS data? And if so, where may I access that? Um, well, it depends on um, what you want to access. Um, so like in the AWIPS, um, not well, – well, I'll say this. So we here at CIRA, we occasionally archive data sets or um, case events, at least, um, that will incorporate mainly GOES, but then maybe a few polar orbiting data sets from the AWIPS point of view, but it's usually not a lot. Now, if you needed access to, say, uh, new CAPS data, or sorry, archived new CAPS data or archived uh, NCC or day-night band data, you can connect with me, and I can try to get you that data sets in AWIPS. Now, okay. there are assortments of archives online, but it just depends on the data set that you have interest in. Well, it would be the new cap soundings, and um, that would be what I would be looking for. Okay. Well, yeah, you can definitely just connect with me. And uh, here at Sarah, we have, a, we have an archive that goes back a few years. Now, there may be certain times where or certain times of the year um, uh, we didn't get access to that data, whether it be like, say, we had a power outage here or something like that, just like the mm -hmm. anomalous things. But but generally speaking, we have an archive that goes back a few years. And uh, depending on your case events, I could try to see what we got. So. It was just it was just May 1st to 22. I'll, I'll touch base with you offline and, and see about uh, if I can get a hold of that data. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, no problem, and um, happy to help. <clears throat> thank you, Brian, for that question as well, uh, and thank you, Jarrell. Um, so the only other question, well, not a question I had, just for those that, of course, you know, couldn't be here today, as well as for those who are, um, just for awareness of all the websites and resources that Jarrell has shared today, be it the quick guides, the quick briefs. Um, all the other resources, the JPSS imagery for users link. We also have that linked on the ER Eastern Region SSD um, satellite Google Sites page. Um, I can drop the link in here again for that right now. Um, the JPSS imagery for users link happens to be on page 16 of our Google Sites page. And a lot of these, all, all the quick guides and quick briefs are on there as well. Jarrell has been excellent with, you know, communication. Um, and I appreciate that partnership, Jarrell. Um, and with all the information that we've been able to exchange with the field. So, um, you know, if there's any questions about data availability, um, you know, he, he's been excellent in replying and all that. So really encourage, you know, any questions to come forward, whether it be about training resources, data availability, like he brought up, or how to access any of the imagery channels that he's mentioned and discussed today or those that, he, that you're thinking of that are off season right now. But of course, discussing the ones pertinent to winter, um, like the MSFR and SFR data sets. So um, all the questions I would have asked were already asked. Um, <laughs> well, I, I have one for anyone that's online. Sure. Uh, you just spoke of MSFR and I'll go back to that real quick okay so this one so if i may ask everyone that's online and whoever wants to chime in you can chime in um do any of you have access to this product or have interest in accessing the snowfall rate products that's my question to you and if not that's totally fine too i guess i'll chime in first um what I've heard about the usage of these products is it's mostly been usage via the online sources, the the not through AWIPS. Okay. Um, so I, I, I've heard positive comments on instances where it's been used, um, maybe somewhat limited depending upon operational demands and how much time they had to look at various resources, be it in and, and, and or out of AWIPS. Um, but that's the extent that I have. Okay. But the animations I'm showing, just note that this is what it would look like in AWIPS. Just that way. Mm -hmm. So, but if there's any feedback on that, that's that's greatly appreciated. Mainly because um, I know the product developer, Wan Ming, out there in uh, DC has high interest in getting that 
more available to other users that may have interest. So. But I'm not hearing anything, so that's that, that's totally fine too. So no, no no worries, either way. But I just had to pose a question and see what happens. <laughs> oh no, you know I think also part of this is there are so many different data products available now that it's a matter of just first step one is awareness. Right. So the, these discussions are the biggest step, and then going from awareness to integration, and yep. um, so and then from integration to feedback. Um, I do see uh, Dave Zaff just. Uh, chimed in on the chat there. He says, because uh, yeah, he's at Buffalo. He says, I yes. have not used it. So, okay. Thank you, Dave, for yeah. chiming in there. I appreciate it. Okay. But we, with the quick guides are online for those. We have those up on the Google mm -hmm. site as well. And if there are further questions, please feel free to come forward um, to you, Dave, or to anyone else um, if there are questions about. So, and yeah, sorry, Brian, down in Texas. I guess that's a little. <laughs> that's a little. Fair enough. No worries. Um, are there any other questions or comments? If not, um, I'll just again send um, a reminder out that this webinar is being recorded. So we will upload the recording to our Eastern Region. SSD Science Sharing Google site page after the conclusion of the webinar. Um, Jarrell, I can't thank you enough, uh, both not just for your discussion today, but as I mentioned again, all the continued um, back and forth support uh, for information to and from the field. So thank you for that. Um, and thank you as well to the audience today on a busy day for well, Southern and Eastern region because of Nicole. So. Hopefully everyone stays well. Um, also wishing everyone a happy and healthy holiday season. Mm -hmm. And we'll see you next time. The next Thank you. Thank you all. Have a great day. You too.